Dramatic and dangerous developments taking place in West Asia over the course of 48 hours. Israel has been conducting a genocidal war against Palestinians and now it looks like it might have assassinated the political chief of Hamas, Ismail Haniyeh. Simultaneously, it has also assassinated a senior leader of Hezbollah. Now, this really takes the region to the brink. We already know the kind of destruction Israel has been wreaking in that whole region, Israel and its ally, the United States, of course. And now this is definitely a fresh step forward. What is likely to happen after these developments? What is there any chance of a ceasefire negotiation at all? Do these, will these negotiations bear fruit? What is happening on the Lebanon front? And what lies ahead for the region as a whole? We'll be discussing all this in this episode of Mapping Fault Lines. We are joined by Prabir Purkaista. Prabir, uh, a development that is definitely going to, you know, for lack of better word, the implications are likely to be quite dangerous. We have seen that uh, the assassination of Ismail Haniyeh taking place. One, of course, he was assassinated, which itself is a huge development, a very dangerous development. But also that this took place in Iran when he was there to attend the inauguration of the new president. And, uh, you know, this really uh, is also in some ways a challenge to Iran itself. So, first of all, like, would you just maybe take us through what this development basically means, especially considering that there was also the fact that, or considering the fact that Hanei was also a negotiator in the ceasefire process, he was closely involved and there were even rumours that possibly a ceasefire was likely to happen at this point, uh, the key negotiator for Hamas is assassinated. Well, that's exactly what uh, the Prime Minister of Qatar has said that how do you have peace negotiations, these negotiations for a ceasefire, when you assassinate the key negotiator of the other side. So this is something which I would say is quite unusual, it would be a mild word to say it. Something, what you say it is dangerous, it's, it was dangerous for the last two months as you have said. So we are really into uncharted territory of not only the negotiations breaking down and there have been large scale uh, criticism of Netanyahu that is not serious about the negotiations which you can discuss later. But the fact that you after assassinating the chief negotiator on the other side in Iran in the midst of a swearing in of the new president who is supposed to be more attuned to peace talks maybe with the United States as well. But that seems to be that you are quite willing to risk the whole region getting Iran into this mix in a much more aggressive way because Iran has responded earlier to Israeli attacks but has still signaled what it is going to do given Israel time and allowed its other allies to come into the defense of Israel so to say with the limited 300 missile strike they did in Israel but it has capabilities are much more. So do we see the extension of this to say next what you said about Fawad Shakar, uh, Shukar being assassinated a top leader of the Hezbollah particularly the military front. So what will Hezbollah do? What will Hamas do? And what will Iran do? These are the three questions because they have to respond in some way or the other. This I think is very clear whether the response can be will not spill over to a much more dangerous war between parties which have not only a uh, lot of arms and ammunition, Hezbollah is much stronger than Hamas and Iran of course is a major player in that region. So I think Israel has really done something which I think the United Nations Secretary General has condemned, the world at large has condemned. The only supporters they have are really the United States and a few European Union countries. Even they have been constrained to be either reticent or said this is not right. So that's where it is at the moment. Absolutely. Uh, Prabir, you mentioned, of course, uh, Netanyahu and Netanyahu just a few days ago was in the United States. He, will, he addressed the uh, US uh, Congress, you know, made some very belligerent statements, sought to give the impression that the United States and Israel uh, are in this war together, which is true considering the amount of weapons the United States has supplied. The uh, cover, diplomatic coverage has provided its refusal to even mildly criticize at various points of time. But uh, there have been a lot of reports in the aftermath of this assassination which says, like you said, that uh, Israel has benefited 
in multiple ways. Of course, it has targeted Hamas, it did not want a ceasefire, uh, Netanyahu does prefer the continuation of war and it pushes Iran into a corner uh, in terms of e both its immediate response and its engagement to the United States. So, in many ways, uh, this is a really, this is a situation which Netanyahu wants, the escalation of the war. But I think a key question here is that what seems to be not only Netanyahu's game plan, uh, but also what is right now happening in Israel, which is definitely in a state of crisis. We have seen, uh, you know, these uh, these reports actually of uh, of what is maybe unthinkable of, uh, say, a, a Palestinian uh, being uh, assaulted, sexually assaulted, and then a large number of people gathering in the defense of those who were accused of this crime. So, what is happening in Israel and how do we link it to the war that's taking place? You know, the two related questions to this. One is the section with who support Netanyahu today rules Israel. That has sections who do not accept a two-state solution. We already know that. But they're also extremely aggressive on lots of counts. And one of this is that our right to torture Palestinians in jail, which is what this was all about. The attack was on a military camp. It was led by parliamentarians, who are with the extreme right, who are a part of the coalition. Their ministers were providing cover and they invaded a military camp where supposedly some of the soldiers who had perpetrated the uh, torture of Palestinian, civil, Palestinian prisoners, they had been arrested. But they were actually not in that place. So they uh, entered two camps on this. And these are the two bases that we are talk, we talk, we'll just talk about a little later. But the real issue is breakdown of the military discipline. When you have ministers, parliamentarians led by others attack a military camp and then are not stopped. After all, military has guns. So we're not stopping them. You're letting this happen. So the rule of law, therefore, does not pertain to obviously prisoner abuse. And you've talked about the prisoner abuse. The headlines which says it was more horrific than Abu Gharib tells the story. And it blew up because a particular Palestinian prisoner was uh, assaulted badly, sexually abused, was in a state of medical collapse. And when he was removed to hospital, then this whole thing blew up. And this is, there has been large scale allegations earlier as well. This is not difficult to cover up. As a response, Israel military took action. And these are the two camps. You can see there are two different camps where these things have happened. So they have closed these camps down. But nevertheless, this is the history of torture, abuse in Israeli prisons for quite some time. After the, the recent war that has broken out against the Hamas, obviously this has been stepped up. That's why, why it has blown up in the way it has. But we have a long history of knowing that the Israeli has or regularly does torture prisoners in different ways, denies them food, isolation, all of that is public knowledge. But this is where even that has crossed limits. And the fact that you have a section of the Israeli population, including members of parliament, who are willing to support this, including ministers who are willing to support this, I think that tells its own story where Israel is headed right now. Absolutely. And it's, uh, it's beyond irony considering the fact that Israel is still claiming or at least some sections of its media are claiming that this is about the hostages, is it to rescue the hostages, etc., etc. But what we are seeing right now basically is that this is for uh, the kind of escalation that is taking place is nothing to do with the hostages. It seems to be moving towards a circle of uh, or a cycle of perpetual war and uh, ever escalating war, so to speak, which really benefits Netanyahu politically. And I suspect that's really what's on the agenda here. Well, Netanyahu's game plan, which a lot of people have talked about, is because he's supposed to be uh, under the scanner for things that he has done. So if he ceases to be prime minister, then he has to fight that legal case. Therefore, for him to be the prime minister, he needs support. And in this case, the extreme right, which is supporting him in the, in the parliament, that is where his game plan is. So if a hostage release takes place, then if the things normalize, then it is possible that this 
coalition which is there will fall apart. Therefore, war is in his interest, right. narrow interest is what the argument is. But you know, the point again is it is being carried out in the on the basis that we are going to get the hostages back. But if you take the popular opinion now, it seems to have shifted. Once it was, it initially it had rallied behind the government, which happens when there is a situation like this. But now it seems that the be belief among the people is that Netanyahu is more interested in his survival than in hostage release. And therefore, he is not uh, negotiating in good faith. Now, we are not going to go into the details of the negotiations, which has seen a com continuous shifting of the bar posts, so to say. So, at any point, there is a possibility of, of a settlement. Israel has moved the, right. shifted the line. So, this is where now both the host, those who are looking for hostage release, particularly families, they are saying that this is going nowhere and half of the hostages have probably died. This is what they are saying. And therefore, the pressure on Netanyahu on that score is mounting. And we have the headlines from Haaretz and various other people who said that 70 percent of the people now think that Netanyahu is not doing enough. So will that lead to pressure on Netanyahu? The question is, he's not bothered about the people at the moment. Right. He's bothered about, if he's bothered about how to keep his prime ministership, he's more interested in keeping the extreme right, which is called the religious right, or hardly religious, to be to be supporting him. And they are not interested in any of this. They would like this to fulfill their agenda. That means no two-state solution, drive out the Palestinians if they can, at least drive out them from the land and con convert also West Bank into a form of Gaza. I think right. that is the way it is moving. Whether it is viable, it's possible, that's a different question altogether. But that is not what we are looking at if Netanyahu is looking for a short-term survival. Right, absolutely. Uh, Prabhupada, moving on to the other front, so to speak, the assassination of a very senior Hezbollah leader, Fuad Shakr, as you mentioned, taking place again, important to note, in Beirut, the capital of uh, Lebanon. Only the second time uh, Beirut has been attacked uh, since, the, since October 3rd. The first time was when a senior Hamas leader was uh, killed by Israel. And once again, now Israel of course claims that this is uh, retaliation, etc. We will come to some of those points of the earlier attack. But once again, uh, a very open challenge to Hezbollah, it seems like almost invitation uh, saying that, uh, you know, strike, strike at us and uh, again confirming that whole point about Israel definitely wanting an escalation of that war. Well, if an escalation of war takes place, according to their own armed forces commanders who seem to be arguing now we should go for ceasefire. Mm. This would be something which would not help Israel because as you have said Hezbollah is certainly far more powerful than Hamas and if it becomes a war then yes there is no question Beirut would be destroyed like it was earlier in the war with Hezbollah. There would be large scale destruction in Lebanon but at the same time Hezbollah has the ability, which it has shown time and again, to be able to strike within Israel. So I think that's a very def different uh, ball game compared to what, to what it has been vis-a-vis -vis the Hamas. So that is one. Secondly, they are the same day. They have struck also in Iran against Haniyeh, against also uh, the presidential swearing in where Haniyeh was there. So this is also mean, it also means that Hezbollah will have the support of Iran, at least definitely as far as logistics are concerned. So I think this is a scenario where a two-front war will take place, one which is taking place already in Gaza and the second in Lebanon. So what is the calculation Israel has is not clear to me because as far as I can see, this, by all accounts, is a losing war for them. Right. Losing war meaning this is not where they can extract any concept <coughs> of victory, victory and it will lead to even more isolation of Israel if that we'll talk about later. But it, it does mean that Israel will f now face an opponent uh, who is if it is not a peer competitor, at least has the ability to create large-scale large destruction 
within Israel and also even in its capital, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, all of it. Of course, Jerusalem is a mixed population. They are more likely to perhaps attack Tel Aviv. So in all of this, yes, destruction of both is the likely scenario. And you can see this picture, though the picture in headlines is how Hezbollah attacks Israel. But the reality is if you see the totality <coughs> of attacks, Israel has been attacking Lebanon and Hezbollah in a much larger way than the retaliation of Hezbollah has been. They, you can see that they have also, as you said, uh, had assassinations within Beirut. They have attacked Hamas earlier, Hezbollah in Beirut. So all of that while it is going on, it also shows that Hezbollah has been able to strike within uh, Israel. And the northern section of Israel now has, has seen something like 80,000 refugees who have taken shelter right. in, inside. And that's not something that Israel has been able to prevent. So will it now go over into open war? That is something we have to see. And it doesn't bode well for the world and certainly not for the region. Absolutely. Right, Prabir, and just to follow up on that, we do know that Israel is claiming that you know, this was in retaliation to an attack on the Jolan Heights, where I think 12 people were killed, if I'm not mistaken. But the Jolan Heights also emerging as a very key strategic point in uh, if a conflict would break out, especially considering also that it is uh, occupied territory. It's an interesting point about what is the relationship with Jolan, Syria and Israel. Because Jolan is occupied Syrian territory. Now, Jolan Heights has a large Druze population and the people who are killed in the attack, uh, we'll talk about whose uh, really missile it was, that killed 12 young people who were playing football over there in, in a field. So the question is who did the attack? At the moment it's not clear because uh, Hezbollah has said we did not do it. We have no reason to attack Jolan because the Druze are not our enemies. That is one. And secondly, the Druze population, are, a lot of them still consider themselves Syrian citizens because that's what they originally were. Though it's also true a section of the Druze population also sides with Israel as a part of its identity, particularly after the uh, Syrian upsurge which took place, which also had a lot of sympathy in this part. So this, this mixed heritage of Jolan, also makes it very unlikely why Hezbollah would strike at Jolan because they have nothing to gain and the Druze population is not something they would like to alienate. So the argument is it's either a missile which went astray or it was a part of the Iron Dome uh, missiles which were used to shoot down other anti-missiles as it were and were fell back into this part. There have been various conjectures, pictures of the, uh, the the crater that was there and saying this is not a Hezbollah rocket, but it's possibly a rocket which belongs to Israel. So these are all conjectures. We have no proof of any of this. Also, interestingly, Israel hasn't provided much visual evidence of what the missile was, whatever the crater was, what, are the, what is the size. So not enough forensic evidence for the world to see. So that is one issue. But yes, that's going to add also further tensions in this. But it's also interesting what the Druze population is over there saying. They said, we don't want a war because of this, because we, that will only lead to more of our people dying. So they have called for peace. So that's, we have to watch what happens. It's all grist to the war mill that Israel is now churning. Absolutely. And Prabir, finally talking, coming back to a topic we discussed earlier, which is really what is the larger implication for the region? We do, of course, know, uh, you know, we've talked about in the past, we talked in this show about Palestine and uh, Lebanon, of course, but there are also uh, Ansar Allah, Ansar Allah in, uh, in Yemen, which has been part of this, uh, you know, op these operations as well. There are also the militias in Iraq, again, which Israel struck recently, if I'm not mistaken. And of course, overall, there is the United States whose umbrella, under whose umbrella most of these Israeli operations are happening. So in general, what do we see ahead for the region? Well, that's a very big question. And I'm not sure that... It's a crystal ball question. Uh, yeah, crystal ball question. 
but this shows also the extent of the enemies that Israel has created over a period of time and enemies who are willing to also use military force if confronted by military force from Israel. Now, Iran we know that has been a long term competition and Iran has also been targeted by the United States. So, Israel feels is a good opportunity to use Israel to crush Iran and their peer competitor in the region. Now, as of now, United States does not want to step into that. They are willing to defend Israel as they did when the missile attacks took place, but they are not going to go beyond that appears because I do not think Biden wants a war with Iran at the moment and if Trump comes in then all bets are off but that is a different scenario. But this does not seem to be something that they would like to do. So as you said Syria is already involved because Israel attacks it regularly. So they have also a stake in any battle with Israel because Hezbollah has been their major ally. So this is Iran. Iraq you said there are militias which are United States has been targeting them so has Israel and then you have Yemen who is willing to come into this battle. They have had a missile attack on Israel to more than 2000 kilometers away. So all of this is powder keg if you will and it is also true that at the moment given what Israel is doing that countries like Saudi Arabia, countries like Oman, United Arab Emirates who are willing to normalize relations partially to Israel, certainly Oman and UAE have already done that. They are at the moment withdrawing from this kind of relationship and the key question of course is also that of Egypt. Now Egypt also given what is happening in Gaza, Egypt also is unwilling to support Israel now. So I think Israel is much more isolated than it earlier was. The tacit support is only from Jordan who also helped shooting down the Iranian missiles if they went over Iran that was over Jordan that was the argument. But Jordan is the only ally that it has in the region and it is also a tacit ally it is not an open one. Then of course you have <coughs> Turkey which is also in the mix. So given this Israel as a lone outpost, outpost of NATO if you will appears to be at the moment much more isolated than it earlier was. So I think this is really going back 20-25 years when Israel, Israel was regarded as an outcast in this region. I think that status has come back and with Netanyahu's current trajectory and Israel's trajectory in which the extreme right has become much stronger. I think we are in for a long uh, re, re, what shall we say, reorganizing the politics of this region and crucially the issue is really what happens inside Israel because what we are hearing is that a lot of the people, 25 percent of the people are willing to migrate out of Israel. They do not see this as their promised land anymore. So what Elan Pape has written somewhere that it is the religious right Judea which is really conquering over a secular Palestine which is what the Israeli secular population initially was but the West Bank settlements are really emerging as the old Judea Samaria which will take over the whole of Palestine recast it based on something like 2000 years old history. So where genocide, all kinds of violence was permissible. So I think we, if that is what is happening, I do not think Israel can hold on to that for too long. No state can. You can do it for 5 years, 10 years, not longer than that. But the problem of course they have nuclear weapons and what they have started might tip Iran over all to become a nuclear weapons power because they already have reached the threshold. Thank you so much for being. We will be monitoring uh, the developments in this region also the kind of resistance that has taken place uh, globally definitely worth mentioning contributing further to identifying Israel as an apartheid state calling for 
you know, more sanctions calling for more pressure on it, just like South Africa faced some decades ago. All of this together likely to uh, work towards the isolation you were talking about. Thank you so much for talking to us. And that's all we have time for in this episode. We'll be back soon with another episode analyzing not just West Asia, but other parts of the world. So keep watching Mapping Fault Lines and keep following NewsClick.